Hello, I'm Roger Woods, the preaching minister and one of the elders of the Wald Lake Church of Christ in Wald Lake, Michigan. Like many of you, church life has been disrupted. But as Paul reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 9, even though we may be figuratively chained, God's word is not. We hope that these lessons, as well as other online and print resources we will give you in the upcoming days, will help you during this time, that they will give you hope, that they will give you peace as we continue to live through this difficult time. I will again offer a Lord's Supper devotional at the end of the sermon. If you want to get your supplies prepared, I invite you to partake of the Lord's Supper with me. In the Sermon on the Mount, from Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus declared, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. We often call those who are not yet Christians, but are interested in learning more, seekers. Churches will even have special services or classes for seekers. And I'm all for reaching out to those who are seeking Christ and using many ways to reach them, to get to them where they are. Paul said he became a Jew to the Jews and a Gentile to the Gentiles so that he might win some. Within God's will, we have to be willing, like Christ, to adapt ourselves in order to reach the lost. We may need to sing a different style of hymn and praise chorus. As we are learning from this COVID-19 pandemic, we might need to incorporate more technology, even changing traditions of how we do church. In this new normal, we cannot have sacred cows that are not sacred to God. But we aren't here today to talk about evangelism, but rather sanctification. The process by which we, as resurrection people, become more like Christ. Not how we get saved, but how we grow in our faith. You see, as Christians, we should understand that each and every one of us is a seeker. As seekers, we discover our Savior and enter into a lifelong quest in which we seek to be transformed into His image. Sadly, we have bought into a worldly model that views salvation as a transaction. Once it is done, salvation is ours, and there's not a lot we have to do following that. And this can keep us from knowing the fullness that is ours in Christ. Your salvation is only one of the gifts that you are given in Christ. Our failure to continue to seek Christ, to grow in our faith, keeps us from experiencing them and can even, it can even endanger our salvation. This is Peter's point in 2 Peter 1, verse 3 and following. His divine power has given us everything we need for life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God has provided everything we need for life and godliness. But to enjoy these blessings, we must add to our basic faith. The walk of faith is an active one, not passive. You cannot passively follow Christ. Have you ever tried to follow someone in your car when you don't know your destination? You have to keep up with them, don't you? Or you'll lose them. You have to actively keep up 
or get lost. Friends, our Lord is alive. And to follow him means that we have to keep our eye on him because he's not going to be in the same spot that he was yesterday or last week or last year or 50 years ago. Yes, our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but that doesn't mean that he's not moving to reach the lost in new ways. We need to keep up. We are commanded to submit to Christ. But even there, we submit to him so that we can be raised to live in him. Live is an active verb. We are to live in Christ, not just exist in him. It follows that to live in Christ implies an active approach to our faith. Jesus taught in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, that the life that is pleasing to God is an active one. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Ask, seek, knock. Add to your faith. When we do this, God has promised that he will give us good gifts. He will give us precious promises. And let us participate in the divine nature because in Christ we have escaped the corruption of the world. Why would we want to go back into that again? How do we accomplish this? First, we have to make following him our personal quest, like Don Quixote. Then we have to realize that we can't succeed in this quest alone. As a child, Beth was captivated by Jesus' words in his prayer in, on prayer in Matthew 6, verses 5 through 6. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Beth shares, in the wee ranch house where I grew up, my bedroom was my sanctuary. But my real inner sanctum, the only space that made me feel uninhibited enough to unload my youthful angst onto God, was my closet. Crouched in this dark, tiny confines, I'd spill my tears of anger and words of confusion over childhood slights and perceived wrongs. I took God literally at his word, going into the only secret place I had, trusting that my Heavenly Father, who saw my hidden heartbreaks, would be there to meet me. As she matured, and, fall and, and moved away from home. This habit fell by the wayside. After all, how convenient is it to have a literal prayer closet when you're in a dorm room, or you're sharing an apartment with a roommate, or a home shared with a spouse? Years later, as her husband faced cancer, she rediscovered her closet. She shared in an article in the magazine Today's Christian Woman, my husband slept downstairs on the recliner. I stood before our bedroom mirror, struggling to make myself presentable for the upcoming physician visit. My stomach nodded with apprehension. My face haggard from worry. I was so overwhelmed with distress that I walked into our closet, shut the door, flung myself onto its floor, and broke down in the darkness. God, God, I flailed. Help me. I'm frightened my husband has cancer. I am so afraid of losing him. She continues, Somewhere between my flowing snot and convulsive sobs, God's presence filled that closet. His voice inaudible, yes, but clearer than any sound I have ever heard, told me everything will be okay. I'll never forget that experience, she says. Since then, whenever I need to process and pray with a candor I'd feel uncomfortable sharing among others, I head towards my closet. There, I momentarily shut out distractions and concentrate on seeking God alone in secret. What great advice. Friends, as we retreat into forced isolation, let it move us into our prayer rooms to seek God. One of the most powerful movies that I have ever seen recently was the movie War Room. A young woman, a realtor with a troubled marriage, comes to list the house of an older woman. 
but she doesn't know is that her life is about to be turned upside down and then put right side up again. The means by which this is accomplished involves a small room and a lot of prayer. I won't tell you much more in case you haven't seen the movie, but I would tell you to put this on your viewing list. I, you might call it your COVID-19 confinement list. You know, it's a great movie to watch. I think the point here is that we need to be intentional as we follow Jesus. Alan Kraft writes, To drink deeply of Jesus is to build into our life frequent moments in which we intentionally stop and become aware of his presence with us, allowing him to hydrate our souls, no matter where we are or what we are doing. This intentionality is often referred to as practicing the presence of Christ. We can practice it anytime and anywhere, while we're standing in a crowded elevator, driving on the highway, working at our cubicle, waiting for some medical test results, taking an exam, or lying awake at night. And I would add to this list, waiting for the next news update. The good news is we're not limited to our closets, but we must seek him if we're going to find him. But I want to stress that there is no such thing as a personal quest for God. God never intended it that way. To make our personal quest to seek God effectively, we must rely upon the companions that God has placed before us. Spiritual formation is the general banner that we use when we talk about seeking God. But too often, we see the spiritual disciplines such as reading scripture, praying, meditating, fasting, in an individualistic way. It's easy to forget the important role that the church community plays in our growth as individuals. In her book, Traveling Mercies, the author Anne Lamott shares a story she once heard from her minister that illustrates the necessity of having others in our presence, and especially the necessity of the church. She writes, a little girl got lost one day. The little girl ran up and down the streets of the big town where she lived, but she couldn't find a single landmark. She was very frightened. Finally, a policeman stopped to help her. He put her in the passenger seat of his car, and they began to drive around until she finally saw her church. She pointed it out to the policeman and then told him firmly, You can let me out now. This is my church. I can always find my way home from here. Lamont further writes, And that is why I have stayed so close to my church. Because no matter how bad I am feeling, how lost and lonely and frightened, when I see the faces of the people at my church, and I hear their 20 voices, I can always find my way home. The church is the flesh and blood reminder of the home that we are seeking in heaven. She is our family, and when we are together, then our Heavenly Father is there with us. This is not as easy as it was just a week ago. Things have changed. And we have learned that our church is even more vital to our lives than we understood when we could take it for granted. Soon I'm going to be setting up regular Zoom conference meetings that our church can uh, participate in. Video chats live. We can talk to each other. We can study. We can pray. We can have that family FaceTime that we're missing so much right now. Keep an eye out for your emails, for the times, and how to join these meetings. We'll also be sending out regular emails so that you can continue to pray for each other, be encouraged, and stay informed. We'll all, we always need each, each other, but now we can appreciate that even more. We need to remember, we're not alone. God is with us, and his church is with us too. That's comforting to me. I want to encourage each of you to personally seek God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. As the deer pants for the water, so should you pant after God. Seeking him as you would seek water in the desert. But never forget, that God has placed guidelines, guides excuse me, and companions beside you. Alone, you will never find God. But together with your spiritual family, 
You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not be faint. And as Isaiah reminds us in chapter 40, you will rise up on wings like the eagles. Why remain bogged down in the miry clay when you can soar? Christian, are you seeking Christ as you should? Are you actively following by taking up your cross daily? If so, good. If not, then use this opportunity today. Use this opportunity that the COVID-19 pandemic has given us to recommit your life to being a follower of Christ and not just an observer of him. Are you seeking Christ today? Do you want to know more about this Jesus you've heard so much about? Have you been too busy to look into him? Too distracted? Well, today could be a good day to start your journey to him. Please don't hesitate to call, to text, to FaceTime, Skype, or email me. We may not be able to meet in person, but we can certainly meet in some virtual form. And by the way, the post office is still working. Send me a letter if that works for you. If you're ready to give your life to him today, we're ready to assist you. The church has not closed. Along your journey, you will come to a watery grave called baptism, where you will die to self and come alive in Christ Jesus. And even here, tradition will change just a little on how we do baptisms, but you can still be immersed into Christ. By your faith and obedience to Christ, your Lord, you will be saved. And as you rise from the watery grave, you will come to true life and power by his resurrection. Many have gone through that grave and lived to tell you this, that the new life, the life that is empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is better than the old life. This hope is why we can celebrate as we partake of the Lord's table today. Yes, the bread represents his body, given for you and for me. And the cup represents the forgiveness for sin that we gain through his blood. But without the resurrection, neither would have meaning. As we approach Easter, let us remember that the resurrection is celebrated each time we come to his table and commune together with him and with one another. So today, as we are again separated physically, let us remember the bond that we share in Christ through the Spirit. The Comforter, our risen Lord sent to be our constant companion, is with us. And then remember this. If we are in Christ, we have His Spirit, and we are connected with each other, and also, via the same Spirit, connected with our Lord Himself, who breaks bread with us today. And so we join with Christians around the world today and across history as we come to his table, spread with the richest of spiritual feasts, even in the presence of this invisible enemy. Paul, in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 23 through 25, wrote, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you bow with me as we partake of the bread? Holy God, we come to you this day, separated by distance, but not spiritually. Through your Spirit, we are one, even though we are apart. Father, we thank you that we can enjoy this time of communion with your Son, with you, with your Spirit, and with each other. We pray, Father, as we partake of this bread, that we will remember that Jesus loved us so much that he gave up heaven's glory, took on our form, our flesh, became human, so that he could be that perfect sacrifice that we could not offer, that we could not pay for our sins. In his name I pray.
Amen. Let us partake of the bread. And now let us pray for the cup. Holy God, through the new covenant obtained by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are cleansed of our sins. As the Apostle John reminds us in 1 John, the first chapter, if we are walking in the light, then his blood continually cleanses us of sin. Thank you for this weekly reminder that his blood cleansed us from sin that it continues to cleanse us from sin, that we have great confidence and hope in our calling and in our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close together today, I'd like to give you the opportunity to recite Scripture with me. This is one that you know, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Go with God, and remember that his divine power has given you everything you need for life.